Cross Cart fans. Today we're going to finalize the series on the KJ Racing Homebrew Kit. Now, I have a packed hub here and I've got a drilled and tapped axle. If you want to see how to do all that, check out parts one through three. This is going to be for high power output, how to make it as strong as possible. Uh, the motivation for this, um, I've got a Hayabusa and I'm putting Busa power to this, which is totally possible, but we have to make it the best we can. Uh, at Busco Beach, one of the builders uh, from Jumper Cable Dads has a ZX11 motor, 145 ponies uh, transmitting through this. Now, what happened to him is uh, he did not weld his bolt here. He didn't weld the center bolt holding, holding the hub to the end plate. Now, what that did was it gave this a little bit of room to wiggle. Now, once that starts wiggling, it starts eating away at the hub and the axle, and it eventually just fell off. Uh, to get the correct chain offset for his motor, which was a ZX 1100, 145 horsepower, he used three spacers. Now, that changes your pivot point. When your sprocket is right against this end plate, your pivot point is right on the meat of this axle. When you start moving that out, your pivot point goes more to the hub than to the axle. So you are relying on the connection of the hub to the axle for strength. So this bolt holding it on place is under a lot of stress when you do that. Now, I, I did not put a limit on how many spaces you can use. Uh, I personally wouldn't use more than two, but this was a great example of how we can make this stronger. I'm always looking to improve stuff, not just say, no, you can't do that. So we did fix it, not in the field, but later. So the parts individually are strong enough. Our goal is to figure out how to get them to fit together and not come apart. That's our goal. That's what we're going to do here today. And before we do that, um, the plans are updated as of the filming of this video. There's now options and recommendations for tools. So on our axle, the one end already has kind of a center punch on it. But when you slice it in half, you have an open face. And sometimes it can be hard to find center on that. So I found a tool called a bell punch. Now what that does is you pick the size you need, it centers on there, and then you just tap it with a hammer and you have center for at least 130 seconds. Uh, this doesn't have to be absolutely centered. I know there's gonna be some disagreement. A 16th or a 30 seconds is not going to destroy your build. Sure, it'd be better if it was perfect, and this will get you a doggone close, if not exactly close. A uh, method I also use is using the hub, using my drill press plate, locking that in, and using that as a vertical. Drill presses are automatically centered, so I would just put the press on there, and then just kind of get a mark, and then finish punching it with a punch. That got me extremely close to center, if not exactly center. Also on the list to upgrades to the homebrew rear are new brackets. Now, one size doesn't fit all, and depending on what motor you're using, you might get some interference off of the case or just misalignment issues vertically. Um, there is a second set of plates that gives you an extra inch off the bottom. So that will help you with chain clearances off the bottom of your motor uh, using motorcycle engines and running the chain the way we do. Sometimes you get, you run into the shifter or other things. Now keep in mind that moving your rear end up, however much you do it is going to directly affect your ground clearance, your maximum ground clearance, I should say. So if you're going for the tall boy uh, mud slinging cross cart, you want your rear end as low as possible. But if you build them like I do with 10 to 15 inches of clearance or five to 15 inches of clearance, 
you can use this and still have all the clearance you want, okay? Also, mounting tabs. There's the standard ones that come in the current plans, but I've also given you two more sets to help you with vertical clearance, vertical chain clearance, that is. Uh, all the measurements for this and helping you decide which ones to get are in the plants. So check that out. Now, I've already told you that I'm using the Busa and I'm already having just a touch of chain clearance issues and I don't want to use a roller. So I'm going to get this welded up and show you how the clearance changes with it. Now, while these bearings are warm from welding and the axle is cool from not welding, uh, we can start working on the hubs. So my personal technique is to put the already centered end on the sprocket side since the brake rotor needs less tolerance. I don't know if that makes sense. So get that in there. Ugh. We'll start our hub. See if she'll go. Yep, look at that. Almost there. Yep, there it is. So maybe a little, a little too much. Okay. So I have this sitting on my vise, so it's all sitting flush. Now the idea here is to get our hub on there. Now. There's also a chamfer on this side of the axle, which gives you a nice little pocket for weld. Now I put this side flush because our axles in alignment don't come out 100% perfectly. Um, so there's a little dip on this side. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this hub and we're gonna weld it right there. Okay, so this hub is gonna be permanently affixed to the axle which is not gonna let it slip off at all. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so there we have it. I welded it and then I ground it down smooth. Now I stayed away from the outside edge because we still need reference for flat so uh it's not recessed or dipped at all there is that 30 second that was in there to give us a little room for welding and you can see how much that helped penetration to attach this oh so cool so now we can still disassemble this because this hub isn't on there we just have to push the axle out this way so at this point you can choose to continue working on it with the axle installed or you can pull it out and do it that way. So our next step is connecting the end plate. Uh, I've already countersunk the center hole. And remember, the sprocket side end plate has bigger holes than the brake side end plate. That's the way to tell them apart. So I'll just get that back in there. I'll get my bolt and I'll just crank this down tightly. Now from here you have options. Um, I've already shown you that you can countersink these holes, drill and tap your hub and put bolts in there. Now that was when we could make this completely uh, removable, but I think we are just gonna make this side permanent and as strong as we can, but still remove it as an axle assembly. So I've kind of strayed away from that. It's a lot of work. It kind of sucks. It's hard to line these up exactly. And I think this could be just as good uh, without the hassle. So let's show you that. Now from here, I'm going to get my super handy drill press vise. Now this is one of the handiest tools I've bought. It is worth every single penny. 
Uh, I removed the bolt from the brake side so that we don't mess up those threads. And I'm just going to drop this hub right into there. And I'm going to lock it down. That's going to give us a stable platform to work from. I'm going to make sure this is tight. And then I'm going to take these four holes and I'm going to center punch them. And then I'm going to get a bit that is roughly the same diameter as these holes. Maybe just a little bit smaller, just like that, just in case my punches aren't lined up perfectly. Now I'm going to take this, put it in my drill press, and I'm going to drill down about 3 16 of an inch. And that way I'm going to fill that hole, connect the hub, and basically create a solid bowl of weld, which could be just as strong as a bolt. And I'm just going to fill all the way up, just connect this plate to that hub completely. All right, with our holes done out a little bit, make sure they're nice and clean. I'm gonna set them back over here by my welder. I'm just gonna fill all those up with nice weld. So now we're just going to pull this axle out so that we can weld this hub on the inside of the end plate. Now this is strong. I'll tell you what, incredibly strong. We've got weld everywhere. We've got all these pieces being held together, but there is one more thing we could do. Now, since the axle rides inside of a bearing that are not splined, we can weld between these splines. That's just an extra layer of anti-movement that we can put in here. Now, once we put that weld in, we are gonna have to trim it to the axle diameter so it'll still slip into the bearings. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go maybe every third third spline just to help lock it in because this is only for slippage it's not for strength well i started out strong but then i really made a mess of things we got a lot of cleanup to do on this no big deal So our drive side is super, super duper locked in now. Uh, for this, I just visually inspect it. Just take a look down the shaft and see if there's anything sticking out. If there is, trim it down a little more. Yeah, so now we can just put this back in here and start working the brake side. A good way to check to make sure it's all the way in and that your new welds didn't keep it from going in all the way is to put your brake side hub on and to check your clearance. If it's the same as it was before we welded everything, then it's good. Mine is sitting uh, just a hair past flush. I might give it another tap. And yeah, it looks like it's all the way in. That welding may have just pulled that hub a little bit. Space it out. Look at those bearings. For those of you worried about welding and bearings and stuff, these bearings are made to handle high heat and we've got a lot of uh, heat displacement. This thick hub here is gonna hold heat, but not more heat than the bearings can handle. And as far as the end plates go, they also distribute heat well. So for the brake side, we've already got our hole chamfered. Uh, personal technique is I line up 
the drive side and the brake side. Just a little OCD, I guess. Now crank that down nice and tight. Ugh. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I'm gonna tap these holes and then I'm gonna fill them with weld to weld the end plate to the hub. I'm not gonna weld this hub to the shaft. So this is still gonna be removable, but super strong on its own. So now we just loosen this bolt. Take the end plate and hub off and weld our hub. All right, so with our brake side done completely, we just put that hub back on the axle. And we can tighten in our bolt. This is an incredibly stout rear end right now as it sits. Incredibly stout. Get that snugged up in there. So this is very stout and very smooth. Looks, look at that. We did a good job on this. And we've got one more inch of clearance for our chain. Now, the only problem from here is twisting, okay? So this is your chain side, this is your brake side. As that 150, 200 horsepower pulls on this to make your wheels go, it's going to want to twist this whole entire thing right here. Now, there are several things we can do to combat that. Number one, we can make thicker plates. So these are flat and you choose the thickness of metal. You can get half inch, one inch, whatever you think is gonna work. Um, my preference is 3 16 but I think I printed these off as a quarter. Yeah, so I printed these as a quarter because I'm putting Hayabusa power to them. So a quarter inch thick is going to not want to twist. Our bottom is held in place by the tabs that go to the frame and the top is held on by a tie rod that we're gonna fab up. So you tighten this for chain tension, all right? You're still gonna have to pick the right amount of links for the chain, so set these at center and use both of them. Uh, I use one on the Predator engine because it's a Predator engine, it's 18 horsepower. You start putting 100, 150 horsepower through one of these, it's going to stress it out. So use both sides to get that triangulation to keep it from twisting. So there's another new part in the plans I got for you guys, and that is an inside tab. Check this out. You've got your bolt, you've got your inside tab, you've got your heim joint, and you've got your outside tab. Look at that, look how it squares it up. Now, you can use a offset misalignment spacer towards the inside, slide that on, and look at that. Look at that, you've got room to triangulate. This is essentially boxed in, which makes everything stronger. Now, the one thing I will say, and this is a hard one to get around, but we don't need to, because like I said, the drive side is the stress point, right? So it doesn't look like we can use both sides. Can't box both sides, but that's okay. We only need one box because of the stress this side's under. Look at that, look how cool that is. That's gonna keep this upper tab from twisting under the stress created by this. So just weld that in, run your bolt, run your chain tensioner, and this is gonna be so strong. <laughs> Speaking of boxing, <laughs> we can make this stronger. 
by boxing. Check this out. Now, I'm not going to do this because I used quarter inch plate and I'm pretty sure that's gonna be strong enough. But, look at this. We can box the lower side to reduce that twisting that's being imposed on these two brackets. Um, now the top and bottom are supported and with that extra tab, it's going to draw strength from the center of the strongest part of that, which is this housing, all right? So using this housing to distribute strength everywhere is huge. If you want, you can box it up. Look at that. So that's it, the final chapter of the KJ Racing Homebrew Rear End. Maybe. <laughs> You guys should know I'm always looking for ways to make this stuff better. And speaking of better, I've got one more little treat for you. So here is a Miata 4x100 hub as prescribed in the plans. Now, I redrill this to a 4x110 bolt pattern for common ATV wheel sizes. Now, if you're not wanting to use a 4x100 bolt pattern, I made a template. So you can get this printed. It's a DXF file, just like the rest of the laser cut parts. And it slides on there and fits tightly around the center to give you a place to punch the holes for the 4x110 bolt pattern. It makes it super slick. You're gonna see these holes and say they're too small. Well, they're made to fit a punch. So the punch fits in there perfectly. You punch it, you drill the holes, and it is the best you can get without busting through that outer ring. Now, if it does bust through there, no big deal. Um, you have four bolts holding your wheel on. I've put these through absolute torture and they've held up just fine. Uh, I might make an outer ring that kind of seals all that in, but I haven't had one fail. so. It's I'm not motivated to fix it because it's not broken. Now, we just did a build with cars and cameras and we used one of my homebrew rear ends on that KTM 525, which is a torque monster. Torque is what tears things apart, not necessarily horsepower or speed. And we used all of this and it performed flawlessly. It is such an amazing cart. If you haven't checked out that video, definitely check it out. We built an, a VF1 in four days. Absolutely nuts. So as of the filming of this video, uh, the plans for the rear end are updated. Uh, when I started this, my whole idea was to give you plans and then you watch the videos to build stuff. Well, for the rear end, I'm going to do it where there are like Ikea type instructions, photos, words, reading, so that you can just follow it step by step without having to watch a video. The videos will definitely help you finish it with better visuals than pictures. So if you already have the plans, uh, just follow your original email link when you bought them and re-download them, unzip them. They'll be the fresh set. Uh, if you haven't yet, then you're gonna get step-by-step -step instructions on how to build this amazing piece put in your cross cart. So winter is here, playtime is over, and it's time to get back to work on the two-seater. Uh, the rear end, you just watched me do it. Uh, just to give you a visual, that's what I was running into. Um, the chain was hitting the bottom of the case to grab that bottom side of the sprocket. So to help you, to help me, to help everybody, did a little redesign of the rear end. So now I just got to swap this out. I'll probably use this on the VF1 XL uh, so it doesn't go to waste. And we'll get this thing running. Long overdue, I apologize. Uh, right as I was getting into the meat of all of this, uh, I had a bunch of fun events pop up. So I was spending all my time prepping for those, going to them and then cleaning up afterwards and getting you guys videos when I could. But yeah, I'm hoping to take this to Mini Mayhem in April. And it's not too far off. It's a roller. Uh, Got to get the electrical done. Got to mount the pedal box, run the throttle cable, do the shifting. All stuff I've done before. Um, so it's just, it's just a matter of putting in the work, putting in the time. 
I'm going to move this back into the main area so that it's just in my face and I have to work on it. What I want to do <laughs> is keep working on the budget cart. I love that thing so much. Uh, it turned out way better than expected and I want to put like a roof rack on it. I want to put a winch on it. I want to make that like uh, an all around amazing vehicle. And it's such a great platform for it. Everybody that drives it's blown away. So just that, that's what I've been stuck on just because of those reasons. But let's get stuck on this two seater, get it done so we can see what Hayabusa power is like. <laughs> see you guys next time. Enjoy the build.